Hi, you're listening to the Stefan Levera Podcast, a show about Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Today for episode 169, my guest is Jeff Deist, president of the Mises Institute. This show is brought to you by Kraken, one of the world's leading Bitcoin exchanges, offering a high quality platform with high trading volume and low fees, no minimum or hidden fees. They offer 24-7 support. It's really easy to sign up. Kraken are renowned for their security as well. They're consistently rated the best. They've got Kraken Security Labs, and they're also rated the best on a user standpoint as well. Kraken also offer Kraken Pro mobile app, delivering all the security and features you love about the Kraken Exchange in a beautiful mobile-first design for Bitcoin trading. Kraken offer margin trading up to five times, and for those outside the US, futures up to 50 times leverage. Go and sign up at kraken.com. This episode also brought to you by Unchained Capital, a Bitcoin financial services company that helps you to secure your Bitcoin private keys and get loans if you need it. So Unchained Capital have got some really cool updates coming on their Caravan platform, which is an open source multi-signature coordinator. So I'll be having the guys on soon. Make sure you keep an eye out for that episode. But with their standard product, you can use a two of three multi-signature setup. You can use Trezor and Ledger. Cold card is coming soon. And you can split up your keys, which might help you secure them by geographically separating those keys. And also, if you need a loan, you can put up some Bitcoins and get USD liquidity without selling your Bitcoins. And so that can be really beneficial for you. Unchained offer excellent services. They've got awesome content on their blog and they've got open source tools. Go and learn more at unchained-capital.com. Are you in the US and you want to buy Bitcoin regularly without any manual processing? Go to swanbitcoin.com. You can link any major US bank account via ACH and auto buy weekly or monthly. That Bitcoin is then delivered to your wallet or stored with a licensed and regulated custodian. Swan Bitcoin have a focus on education and Bitcoin advocacy. They're also the cheapest in terms of US dollar cost averaging. Check out my recent episode with Corey Clipston, the CEO and co-founder. I'm involved as an advisor with a small equity stake also. So there's givebitcoin.io for Bitcoin gifting and swanbitcoin.com for your automated Bitcoin stacking. Here's the interview. Jeff, welcome back to the show. Hey, Stefan. It is great to talk to you again after a while. Yeah. So look, Jeff, you were recently on the show. Well, it was about a year ago now. And I think it'd be great to get an update from you on uh, where where your head is at in terms of Bitcoin and thinking about you know, the impact that Bitcoin will have on, on society. So uh, where, where, where would you say your head is at on Bitcoin? Well, interesting question. And I know even today, there, you know, there's a lot of Bitcoin communities. They're not all the same. Some of them are pretty rabid. And even today, the Mises Institute still gets grief for like, you guys aren't pro Bitcoin enough, or you didn't adopt it early enough or promote it. And I look back on it and I think that, I think, no, we were exactly right. In other words, we've always advocated for the private provision of money. And what form that takes was not necessarily for us to say, it's or any Bitcoiner to say, it's for the market to say. And the truth of the matter is, is that Bitcoin, like any asset you might expect in its first, let's say, 10 years of existence, has had a pretty volatile uh, roller coaster price levels relative to the dollar or other currencies. That's just a fact. And so if, uh, you know, the Mises Institute has a, a certain image or reputation, or whatever, and if we had been out there all these years saying, oh, yeah, Bitcoin's the greatest thing since sliced bread, uh, we would have had some, some Mises Institute fans go, going all in, maybe you know, putting money they shouldn't put into it when they've got families or something. So I have no regrets about that. Or, um, so I don't take any grief about that. I, I would say that my own thinking has changed in a couple ways, and, and it's embarrassing now when I think back of it. Um, and a lot of it's be due to, um, Safedine's book. It, you know, early on, I had this goofy mentality that Bitcoin, we want private provision of money, just like we want private provision of, let's say, automobiles. We don't want the state to provide them. But Bitcoin's just a brand like Honda. And so we don't promote, or I, I shouldn't necessarily support one brand over another because we don't yet know uh, whether Honda will win the day. Or like early on, AOL versus Netscape, you know, and some of those companies aren't even around anymore. And, and looking back on that now, I think that that was wrong and cringeworthy and that Bitcoin r- really is, the, you know, crypto and vice versa. That I, I don't really want to hear about, um, you know, I don't really have time to investigate other coins. And two, I would say I was naive in the sense that I, I, I saw Bitcoin as maybe this frictionless global payment system, banking for the unbanked, anywhere you could have a, a mobile device and internet access, you know, some uh, 
remote uh, tradesman in uh, a non-developed part of Africa, let's say, was suddenly going to be able to make change for his small business or something like that. And and you know, now that I think about that, now I've read Safe's book. Th- there's just no reason to have uh, you know e- every time you buy a sandwich at Starbucks for that to be recorded on a ledger somewhere or something and taking up space. Uh, you know that that probably doesn't make a lot of sense. But um, I, you know, I do view it as an investment. I'm a, a sort of a monthly buyer. And I look at it this way. Let's say over a course of many years, you put something, not a life-changing amount of money. Let's say you put $10,000 US into Bitcoin over a period of 10 years or something, which is a very minor amount. You know, if that goes to zero, which I don't believe it will, it could. Stranger things have happened. Okay. That's, you know, you've lost $10,000. But if you put $10,000 early on into Google or Amazon or a lot of tech companies, you know, you have millions and millions of dollars now. So, uh, that that's sort of the way I'm looking at it. I don't think the average person, especially a person with responsibilities, if you're a single man, knock yourself out. Uh, if if you have responsibilities to other humans in your life, I think you you know you have to have a balance uh, in your life. But that's look, I'm an older guy compared to most of your audience, and I'm also you know have a I'm in a different spot in life. That it's it's young people uh, who do go all in <laughs> on all kinds of things who who make the changes and the differences in this world. Yeah, really interesting insights there, Jeff. Uh, and also curious if uh, if you've got any thing to share in terms of some of the associated you know, scholars of the Mises Institute and others who have also uh, pa- perhaps they've shifted some of their thinking on Bitcoin as well. I know uh, Dr. Salerno has commented highly on uh, Safe Dean's book, and I know uh, Per Bieland also recently got a copy of Safe's book as well. Is there anything you can share in terms of um, other uh, other scholars of the Mises Institute? I think it's the nature almost of academia or academic professors to to lag behind on things. I think that's just the nature of it because, and and there's almost a rationale for that. Uh, knowledge is something that we advance, I think, painstakingly and not willy-nilly, and that we should never have this sort of hubris towards all past knowledge. I don't like people who say, oh my gosh, you know, the U.S. dollar and gold are for just forever obsolete. The minute Bitcoin was invented, all that stuff should just be thrown in the dustbin. That's not how how civilization advances. And n- you know, nobody alive today is so much friggin' smarter than our parents and grandparents. So I, you know, I, I get that sort of cautious, you know, advancing knowledge. What what is money? Uh, what's what's the role of money? How does it arise? How does it evolve? Who should be in charge of it? How does it have value? All those things are great questions that ought to be thought through. And there's there is a place in this world, I think, for just uh, all in energetic practitioners. And there's a place in this world for uh, you know slower on the uptake thinkers uh, to be there, maybe throwing out warning flags or something like that. So uh, you know, Bob Murphy actually wrote a book on Bitcoin pretty early on, like I want to say thirteen or fourteen somewhere in there, which is interesting. Of course, it, it reads a little dated now. Um, and there, there's been a lot of people who, who are in our circles, who are out there, who are Bitcoin pioneers like Caitlin Long, who's, got, who's creating a full reserve bank that will work with crypto in Wyoming. And that's requiring some changes to banking and, and regulatory laws. Um, so there's, there's stuff going on out there. And, but what people don't understand is that a decade's nothing. There's, you know, people want things to happen so quickly in this revolution. But if you look back uh, to the early stages of the automobile, which is at least as much of a disruption as Bitcoin, if you look at the early stages of the Internet, the early stages of electricity, hugely disruptive, Uh, the early stages of airplane travel, uh, you know, the early stages of radio communication, we always have this this uh, romantic idea that we live in this incredible age of change. But you could argue that someone like Mises, born in the 1880s, who died in the 1970s, you could argue that he saw greater changes than we've seen, um, uh, all the things I just mentioned. And, uh, you know, Peter Thiel argues this, that most of our innovation right now is in software. It's in information technology. But the, the other things, you know, we're not building Hoover Dams and San Francisco Bay Bridges and Sydney Opera Houses, you know, that, that we're not being as innovative in, in lots of other uh, areas of life. We're actually somewhat stagnant from Teal's perspective. And I, I kind of agree with that. I mean, why, why does air travel suck so bad still? Uh, you know, there's all kinds of things. So um, IT isn't everything and uh, software isn't everything. But 
uh, Bitcoin's exciting. It remains exciting. And I, I certainly hope that it's going to create a nice little nest egg for my kids. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's a, that's a totally fair perspective to take. And you mentioned the stagnation in society. And it, is it fair to say that much of that is a result of government regulation preventing innovation in certain areas and that you know sometimes some of these things are almost like a regulatory arbitrage things like the ubers of the world that perhaps got popular enough that they could sort of change the rules a little bit before they were able to before they were fully shut down yes i think that's true uh, regulatory arbitrage is a thing and uber the the brilliance of uber was that it took a lot of unused capacity most people's cars just sit there and then you use it for 20 minutes back and forth to work each day, and then it sits in your garage. You know, and then every additional person goes out and buys another car. That's kind of stupid. Uh, and then we, on top of that, we've got all these cabs driving around with these crazy medallion rules in places like New York City. So U Uber was brilliant in that sense, and uh, it exposed a lot of problems uh, in, in the regulatory landscape because it was so obviously superior. You can, you can be sitting at a bar in the suburbs where there's no taxi traffic. You're not on some busy street and you can hail an Uber and you can see where it is and you can sit in the bar till it gets there. I mean, that's, that's just so clearly superior in every way that people, people immediately gravitated towards it, adopted it. And the regulatory landscape tried to catch up a little bit afterwards and they couldn't quite do it because once, once you got a critical mass of users, it's hard for a mayor, let's say of a city to ban it because there's some, there's some political pressure not to. So it was brilliant in that sense in that they didn't ask permission. They just did it. And there's an analogy there to Bitcoin. But yeah, I think that there is a lot of stagnation in the world. And I think a lot of it's caused by central banking as much as the regulatory regime, because when money's too cheap or cheaper than it otherwise would be, you know, it, it flows into financial assets. It flow, you know, it flows into goofy stuff. Um, rather, you know, rather than we think of uh, the, the the real inventor, or the real entrepreneur in a garage, you know, how much of it flows into just the next iteration of tech, let's say, uh, as opposed to something that's really outside the box. And the, here's the thing, Stefan, is it's you can't calculate it. It's incalculable. It's unknowable. So it's the seen and the unseen from Bastia. And that's what makes our job so tough is we go around telling people, hey, wait, <laughs> if it wasn't for central banks, there'd be all this great stuff that you just don't know about yet. You know that. OK, well, because of central banks, we just built this gigantic skyscraper. It's right here in front of us. And we did it with one, you know, 2 percent interest rates and it's tangible and you can touch it. So, you know, you, you get the challenge in front of us. Yeah. And absolutely. It benefits those people who uh, are closer to the monetary spigot. So typically, you know, if you're a property developer or if you work in a bank, your, sal your salary will typically be higher than people in some other industry. And uh, I think um, also I, I really enjoyed your commentary on some of these rich fund manager billionaire types like the Ray Dalios of the world who uh, essentially had benefited from this extremely strong tailwind and then turn around and lecture us on the limits of central banking. So what were your uh, thoughts on uh, some of the people who were kind of coming, turning around and uh, giving us that kind of viewpoint? Yeah, Ray Dalio is a, a good example of that. Obviously, a very brilliant guy, but anybody with investors, any fund manager, you know, they have a boss at the end of the day. And so they have to say sort of politically correct things. They don't want, uh, even a Mark Spitznagel doesn't want to be out there saying too much, let's say, on the financial talking head shows and drawing attention to his, let's say, his, his anti Fed sentiments, because he has investors who might say, Look, I, I'm in your fund. Why are you out there making waves? Just make money and, and keep quiet. And that's what I would say to Ray Dalio just make money and keep quiet. I mean, here's a guy who's clearly brilliant. Uh, and, and so when he comes out, kind of like Warren Buffett, let's say, with this lament, oh my gosh, the financialization of the economy is too much, and it's unfair, it yields unjust results and inequality, and here's what central banks ought to do, here's, what, here's how we ought to change our tax code, et cetera. It's like, well, okay, let, let's, let's think about that for a second. First of all, most fund managers, most private ec equity uh, managers, their entire model since at least the Greenspan era, but especially since the Greenspan era in the Bernanke era, has been based on leverage. Uh, money has been very, very cheap. So as a result, 
it makes more sense to to do M and A deals using lots and lots of uh, bank financing and not too much equity. So oftentimes, an M and A deal just the the various funds involved might represent you know twenty thirty percent of the acquisition price and seventy percent of its credit, and that seventy percent might be sliced up into tranches so that no one lender. Uh, bears all the risk. And same with the equity, the 30% equity might be sliced up into tranches between the funds. So, you know, when you're gambling in effect, because that's what most M&A deals are, it's the idea is you buy a company, you you fix it. You know, oftentimes that involves layoffs and new management and you sort of strip it of assets and you laden it up with debt and you sell it three to five years later at, at, a, at a capital gain. Uh, and the debt in, that you laid in it, that you uh, imposed upon in the meantime, of course, is, is tax deductible, the interest on it, whereas paying dividends, which nobody wants to do anymore, isn't tax deductible. So that creates an incentive to finance companies and balance sheets or, or you know, have the capital structure of companies be uh, more weighted towards debt. So someone like Ray Dalio, this has been his life's blood for many decades now, is, is skillfully putting together deals. And if you look at M&A volume activity compared to 40 years ago or something, I mean, it's the, no, no, deals were not happening like this at, at the 50s, 60s, 70s, even the 80s. I mean, it's exploded. And the reason it's exploded is because the central banks have made it, in a sense, rational. So here's a guy who gets very, very rich off the financialization of the economy, uh, primarily aided and abetted by the Fed. And, and what I would in my opinion, what I would term artificially low interest rates. And on top of that, as he's going along, you know, first he's a millionaire, then he's a decamillionaire, then a centimillionaire, then a billionaire, then a multi-billionaire. All, you know, all the while he's going along, uh, what they call carried interest, in, uh, which is the tax treatment of fund manager compensation under the U.S. tax code, carried interest is given capital gains tax treatment. Capital gains are taxed at a lower rate generally 15 or 20 percent in the U.S. So he's getting carried interest treatment, which is which is treating really his work more like an investment. OK, and he's not complaining about that, mind you. And more, moreover, because of that tax treatment and because of interest rates being low at the Fed, he is accumulating capital and and and, and you know, more and able to do more and more and more deals. So, you know, if taxes had been higher, this whole time, he's now calls for higher taxes. If interest rates have been higher this whole time, he he may never have gotten to that critical mass of capital where all of a sudden, you know, even at low interest rates, things become exponential and you get a lot richer, a lot quicker. And of course, um, low interest rates also prop up equity markets in the, the extent he's a, a shareholder in public companies or investor in public companies that increases his net worth, just like Jeff Bezos at Amazon. So, you know, here's here's someone like Ray Dalio who um you know if you applied his his prescription for the illness today and you went back and applied it to him early on in his career he may never have gotten nearly as rich as he is now he's obviously a brilliant guy I take nothing away from him um and i'm sure he would have gotten rich under any circumstances but that's what central banks do is they create a big question mark is would you be as rich you know would a guy sells his company for 100 million dollars maybe it would have been 10 you know we can't know again it's unknowable so it creates so much moral hazard and so much questioning in, in society that it gives the left a lot of valid ammunition to say you know gee whiz there's kind of this class of unjust rich people in america that's true <laughs> That particular left criticism is correct. There really is an unjustly rich class in, in, in America and really in all Western countries. So uh, that's an uncomfortable thing for libertarians because we, we want to blame it on the ills of regulated money and not on the ills of markets. So, you know, I, I'm not really so sure I want to hear from Warren Buffett or Ray Dalio about what we ought to do now that they're rich. Because that has kind of a Katie bar the door element to it. And, and remember, if you're a billionaire, let's say you just have a measly one billion, <laughs> not 40, <laughs> not 40 or 100. Let's just say you have a measly one billion. And let's say we enter into a period of draconian authoritarian progressive government. And that government comes along and institutes a confiscatory wealth tax of 90%. Okay. And that means you're down to $100 million. 
90 percent of your billion is is taken from you by the government by some new left-wing bernie sanders government and you know given to all the poor kids in, in your country which of course it never would be um you know and then you're you you are still an elite in society because of of the marginal value of each additional dollar you know because of this of the marginal utility of money a hundred million still makes you elite in society and your you know your your first million means a lot more to you than your 99th million because with just one million that probably means you and your family have a roof over your head and it's food um but with with a hundred million you've got a lot more than that so you can take away 90 percent of an elite's wealth and they're still elite you take an orthodontist who makes 250 grand US a year, lives pretty well, has a pretty nice house, is able to send his kids to private schools, maybe has a, you know, a, a decent vacations every year. And you think, okay, that's a good upper middle class person. Take away 90, and he's got a million dollar net worth or a $2 million net worth. You take away 90% of that. And, and all of a sudden that person is really treading water. And, and so that's the difference is, is, you know, wealth scales in a weird way. And so there really is a relative aspect to it. So you could take away 90% of what Ray Dalio and Warren Buffett had, and they'd still be uber elites. You take away 90% of what average people have, and they're dead in the water. Yeah. And uh, I think you also make a good point. It's almost like someone's climbing up the ladder. And then now that they're at the top, they're just kicking away the ladder to stop some other person climbing that ladder. Oh, absolutely. Um, there, there's no question about it. The people who who got wealthy in the financial sector since about the 80s uh, um, have basically had the most favorable conditions in U.S. history, both in terms of, and I'm sorry to be so U.S. centric, but both in terms of the, the tax treatment of the money they were making as they made it and the access to easy credit, courtesy of the central bank. Yeah. And also that this is becoming very politically dominant as a narrative is this whole idea of, oh, look, these CEOs, they did all these buybacks to pump their own stock price, which in turn pumps their, it gives them the uh, often their their compensation is determined based on the stock price of the company. Uh, but it is also an interesting point because at the same time, uh, there were, there is kind of that interesting question of, well, if the company pays it out as dividend versus stock buyback and the tax treatment difference for the end investor. But at the end of the day, it's driving this funny behavior where companies will do stock buybacks and not have very much of a cash balance left. And then now they're coming to the government with their handout asking for the bailout. Is this the sort of behavior that we should expect in a Keynesian and you know, government monetary interventionist world? Well, we certainly found out in the last couple of months uh, what the term satisfaction for money held means, because, uh, you know, the, le the left has always criticized the idea of just holding large cash balances. It doesn't do anything in society. It's not out there sloshing about and creating momentum and changing hands. And we shouldn't uh, allow companies to have to have all this excess cash, but we find out that they're actually prudent to do so, and that it's going to it, it may well be the difference between companies that survive and don't over the next six months. Companies that have a healthy cash balance sheet continue to to operate, to uh, make payroll, that sort of thing uh, is going to be very very important, and you never know when you might need it. So cash is a great asset right now. Uh, so you know it is it is interesting that. Uh, cash is punished in our society. You can't make much money off of it. If you're lucky, you make one or two percent uh, in a CD or something, one and a half percent, and that's about it. So it hasn't been economic for companies to hold cash. It's been more economic for them to go buy back stock or something. And I, I read someone the other day defending stock buybacks, saying, "Well, that's you know, you're returning capital to an investor, but that's not really true. You're just swapping one kind of capital for another." I mean. Which you know whether the stock or the cash is worth more depends on how the stock and the and the value of the cash perform after that transaction. So uh, any company that engaged that spent cash and especially if they borrowed to spend cash on stock buybacks in the last five years uh, should be absolutely barred from any public uh, stimulus bailout. Uh, you know, z virtually zero interest Fed 
or central bank loan. I, I think that should be an absolute policy. Yeah. Um, and, and it's also worthwhile pointing out that there's such a hidden tax element here as well, right? Because there's capital gains tax in many countries around this world. And at the same time, the fiat inflation has been pushing up the price. And it may well be the case that you bought an asset at a certain real purchasing price, inflation has pushed it up, but in real terms, you're not actually better off. But then the government comes in and uh, stings you with the capital gains tax. Is that not a, a, a essentially that is a stealth wealth tax? Oh yeah, there's no question about it. Um, you buy a, a stock at 100, it takes 10 years to go to 200. Um, you know, you got 100 capital gain, 20% on that's uh, 20, but you're using the uh, a you know, today's 20, not 10 years ago's 20 to pay that capital gains tax. So that's that's the, the rub. And of course, um, look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin's a lot like gold in that for most people anyway, there's some people who are really into transacting with it and buying uh, Lamborghinis or something. That was a few years ago. Um, but for, for most people, it's a, it's a buy and hold item. And, uh, you know, it, it's not doing anything. It's not fluctuating. You got the same number of Satoshis you had before. It, it's just the dollars going up and down. And, you know, don't kid yourself. Uh, Western politicians are going to go get further and further down the path of wealth taxes, which means just a balance sheet tax as your money just sits there. You don't have to buy or sell anything. You don't have to even earn any income, interest, capital gains, dividends, whatever it might be. You just happen to be sitting there. Let's say you're an older person who was successful with some small businesses and you have a net worth of $10 million and you're 70 years old and you're just sitting there not making any money. Um, I'm not sure how much longer Western governments are just going to say, we're okay with letting that pot of money sit there untouched. Uh, Elizabeth Warren certainly made that a mainstay of her campaign. She's not going to be president in the United States, apparently. But um, you know, there, there are a lot of European countries who, who have flirted with a wealth tax. Some of them have dropped it, found it counterproductive, found that it chased away capital. Uh, and you know, the, the world is still mobile. There's, there's still electronic transfer of cash that we don't have total capital controls yet. And that's why Bitcoin is so important because it represents a potential escape valve for people. Uh, you know, I, you know, I've taken your advice and steered clear of exchanges and, and, uh, you know, you, you need a, a hardware wallet or whatever you need, but the, uh, you know, that, that might be, uh, the great underground railway of the 21st century is, um, is getting money out of the grasping hands of these murderous criminal politicians. You know, that that could be an absolutely heroic function of, of Bitcoin maybe someday. Wow, yeah. And I think you're absolutely right to point out that wealth taxes are becoming more popular, even, uh, even here in Australia with superannuation. So I guess the equivalent is sort of like 401k for the US listeners. It's like the government is increasingly sort of making overtures about oh we're in this big crisis and we need a way to pay for it maybe we should redirect the superannuation pot of funds towards pandemic uh you know response or recovery or and is that a, a trend that you see happening around the world yeah i think there, there's a huge pot of money sitting there in retirement accounts and different countries have different uh mechanisms for how they tax retirement accounts in the united states generally uh, you can begin taking money out at 59, age 59 and a half, and you're required to start taking money out, I believe, at 70 and a half. Uh, and so the idea was always that when you get older, you might be in a lower tax bracket, so it'll be good for you in the long term. And of course, it's tax-free growth in the interim. But I, I think they're going to go after retirement funds in the United States because there's there's trillions of dollars just sitting there. Imagine sort of a pile of money or gold. And when the the World War II generation, which is almost all gone now, uh, you know, they're the, the youngest ones are you know well in their eighties now. As that generation has has died off, it left a stupendous sum of money to the baby boomer generation, and a lot of it was never subject to a state tax. Thank God, because. You know, over the years, depending on when it was, there's been for a long time there was a 1.2 million dollar exemption. Now it's up to I believe five million per individual, 10 million per married couple. So um, a lot of that intergenerational wealth 
uh, although it was taxed many times over as, as it was developed, you know, as it was accumulated, you know, via income and savings. Uh, um, nonetheless, it, it transferred from one generation to the next uh, relatively unmolested. I don't think the powers that be are going to let that happen again. In other words, from the baby boom generation to Gen Xers like myself, I don't think they're going to to let that happen. It's too too big of an enchilada just sitting there right in front of them. And, and um, you know, personally, I I'm getting out of my four hundred one k, and I'm very very concerned about that because you know after these last few weeks, especially a, a lot of people's retirements in big trouble. If that's what they were counting on, you know, it's down 30%, 40%, whatever it is. So, you know, fr frightening times. And what this crisis, what this virus and the financial crisis that governments caused uh, is really given uh, folks on the left, I think, an opportunity to say, okay, we need a major reset. We need to rethink everything, how we tax people, how we regulate people, how people work, uh, rethink things like a universal basic income, rethink things like free government health care. Uh, and so, you know, that all, all that stuff's coming and it's our job to resist it. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned the generational conflict as well. I think it might also be fair to point out that older generations have more of a concept of the evils and danger of communism and socialism, whereas perhaps it's fair to point out that a lot of Zuma and millennial types don't necessarily feel that fear because they weren't around in that time. Do you have any reflections on that? Yeah, it's absolutely true. So I'm I'm kind of a child of the 80s. So I at least was was steeped in that kind of Reagan Thatcher era Cold War uh you know, the Soviets. So so I'm old enough to have that as part part of shaping my worldview. But somebody who's 25 now didn't have that. So the term socialism has a different connotation. It, it, it tends to conjure up Scandinavia or something like that. And the, also, the, you know, the, the rise in tech has given a lot of people thoughts about singularity, uh, that we have reached some point of superabundance, uh, that a lot of the knowledge problems that Hayek talked about or the distribution problems that exist in the analog physical world will be uh, done away with in the digital world. And so there's no reason for people to be working uh, just so that they can have a basic apartment or food and healthcare and that sort of thing. And that's, that's a dangerous attitude for a couple of reasons. I mean, first and foremost, it's, it's because people do need to work. We do need to produce the wealth that's around us could go away very easily. And, and people who think that capital and, and, restaurants and energy and roads and shoppings, you know, uh, grocery stores full of 10 million kinds of toothpaste just are just going to happen regardless of incentives are, are crazy and naive. So, you know, we do still need to work. But but even beyond that, work is tied to uh, human flourishing. Now, that, that doesn't mean that uh, we want people working 18 hours in a coal mine and wrecking their bodies with dust and and uh, you know ruining their backs of course of course there was a there were great advancements moving from the agricultural period to the industrial age and now into the information age that's given us huge huge advancements in in health and it it's freed us up to do more cerebral work and and more interesting work maybe but it, work is still part of the the human psyche i mean being productive is just hardwired in us, uh, and so uh, th this is this is disturbing to me. The idea that we've reached the, a singularity because all you have to do is you know take a, a pluck a, a feudal peasant from the Middle Ages and put him in uh, 1900, and they would say, "Oh my gosh, you've solved scarcity." Look at look look around you. There's just, this is unbelievable. There's there's horses just pulling everybody around, and look at these beautiful gas lamps, and you know, and then take somebody from 1900 and transport them into 2020, and they'd probably say the same thing. You know, there's no more scarcity. You guys have everything. This how could there possibly be more? But of course, there's always scarcity, because you know human beings want stuff. You don't have to make us want stuff. We want stuff. There's no need to stimulate demand, uh, attention fed, attention uh, government. We don't, you know, we don't need any stimulus. Uh, what we need is productivity and capacity and production. So I don't believe in the singularity. 
I don't believe in transhumanism. I don't believe in a deterministic arc to history. Uh, M- Mises warned against that. Sometimes societies go sideways and sometimes they go backwards, you know, technologically, economically, sometimes barbarity ensues. Uh, we had two horrific world wars just in the last century. This isn't ancient history. So, uh, you know, we got to work at this. We got we to gotta make sure that we don't screw the pooch and mess up all this, all this wealth and prosperity around us because it's not guaranteed. Excellent way of articulating that. And I think there's a lot of strong rhetoric emerging in these days around UBI, universal basic income, and potentially ideas such as MMT, modern monetary theory, so to speak. Uh, what are your thoughts on whether MMT becomes popular as a way of funding these kind of crazy authoritarian schemes? I think it will be popular. Uh, and you know, MMT has some sort of specific technical requirements and jargon, but it's based on the same theory, the same underlying theory, I would argue anyway, of let's say a Paul Krugman neo-Keynesian, which is that government is sovereign. Uh, As a result, government can issue currency at will to pay its debts. It will never run out of money. And in fact, it need not even pay those debts. And Krugman just said this recently. There was an article that he had cited approvingly on his Twitter feed, and he said, this article does a good job of explaining that we don't need to worry about debt because we won't pay it back, just like we didn't pay back World War II debt. You know, so what he's basically saying is that we can have something for nothing and that governments collectively can do something that none of us can do individually, which is simply live today at at the expense of tomorrow by borrowing forever and ever without a downside. And, you know, if you look at the last 30 years or so, if you look at some of the calls that people in our camp have been have been making since really the 71, since since uh, uh, gold uh, convertibility was completely eliminated. Um, Krugman's kind of been right in a sense. Uh, the, the dollar has been the world's reserve currency. Interest rates have managed to stay, especially in the last 20 years, quite low. And people have continued to buy our treasury debt, although I would argue only because there's the implicit backstop of the Fed, that they can always dump them on the Fed. If another crash happens, the Fed will engage in QE, which of course is doing it once again. And so there, people, I think, in the back of their minds say that this is a safe asset because there'll always be a ready market in the form of the, the, the U.S. central bank itself, if no one else. So I'm not going to be left holding the bag. Um, and as a result of all that, we kind of have, broadly speaking, we kind of have, have done MMT as our monetary policy for, for many years now because a significant portion of the federal budget each year in the United States is, is funded by debt. And so Congress spends more than it takes in. Let's say it takes in three trillion and it spends four. There's a trillion dollar spending deficit. No problem. You know, the Treasury's out there issuing bond debt and that bond debt is is being sold. Uh, sometimes there is less enthusiasm at, at uh, Treasury auctions and sometimes there's more, but nonetheless, it, it is being sold. And, you know, when Uncle Sam is a profligate, drunken, crazed spender who will never get his fiscal house in order, and wants you to loan him money for 10 years at less than 1%, you might think that sounds crazy. Why would anyone loan money to the U.S. government at anything less than junk bond rates? Well, one reason is because other other sovereign bond debt, like euro bonds and and, uh, some European government bonds, uh, is, is is even less. It's negative. So that creates sort of, in a sense, an artificial market for U.S. Treasury debt, because at least it's paying something. At least it's, you know, that your rate of loss is, is slower. So when government for year after year after year spends more than it takes in, in taxes and effectively monetizes the difference, albeit in a roundabout way, because first that treasury debt goes out into to markets for it, and then ultimately is potentially purchased by the Fed. That That's akin to, I won't say it's the same thing, but it's it's akin to a form of modern monetary theory. It's just being done uh, purely on the monetary side rather than uh, the fiscal and tax side, which is the mechanism for, for by which MMT operates, which is just say, you know, the Treasury basically, basically prints as much money as we need. We keep an eye on the economy. And if inflation heats up too much, we raise taxes. Uh, if the economy slows down or becomes deflationary, we lower taxes. And that's the mechanism as opposed to 
it, right now we have kind of a Fed mechanism using interest rates. So, but they're very, very similar. So, you know, the MMTers, I, I hate to say it, but I think they're gaining traction. I think a lot of people look at that and say, well, you know, you, you debt hawks have been talking about the deficit for the last 30 years and nothing bad ever seems to happen, even though it goes up and up and up. So let's just keep spending. I mean, you can understand the allure of that argument. Right. And at some point, these politicians believe that they're getting something for nothing. And so then they'll just keep they'll keep winding that up. Uh, and you mentioned as well around how a lot of bonds, sovereign bonds, are effectively returning negative in real terms because they're giving a very small percentage in nominal terms, but then accounting for inflation, they're negative. So is it also a factor there that some of the regulation that's out there, some of it's like Basel capital requirement regulation and so on that forces some of these companies and maybe big insurers and so on to hold these government bonds, even though they are taking a loss. And that kind of is difficult. Again, if you're trying to explain to people what is the impact of that on society, we're kind of, it's like a foregone benefit. How do you um, articulate that to people that society could have been richer but we've been forced into this kind of subsidization uh, of the government. Well, it's true. There is a, a, an artificial market, for example, for U.S. Treasury debt around the world because certain pension funds are, are required to hold it, cert, uh, uh, you know, a certain amount uh, or a certain percentage, uh, certain institutional investors. And you mentioned the Basel III requirement. So there is people have always thought that U.S. Treasury debt was basically the safest investment. It was it was as good as as cash basically, almost as liquid as cash. And so it, that there's a lot of historical baggage there that creates some inertia and makes people think, you know, and, and as you say, of course, U.S. Treasury debt is, is negative in real returns also uh, relative to inflation. So you say, why does anybody want to hold this stuff? Part of it is just for the certainty. I mean, you lock in this is how much money I'm going to lose over the next 10 years, you know, but, and I know what my loss is. And of course you might, you know, if, if your bond is, is negative 1% uh, and rates go even lower and, you know, you've got it locked in at negative one and rates go down to negative three, you know, you have an asset you can sell. So there's not just the loss of, in, it's not just the interest, you know, you've got the underlying assets, so you might sell it for a capital gain, even though you're losing money on the interest side. So that's sort of two, two separate questions. And so a lot of it is just that people believe that the U.S. economy is the biggest and baddest economy in the world, um, that the U.S. dollar is the biggest and baddest currency, and implicitly, I hate to say it, that the U.S. military is the biggest and baddest nuclear, you know, uh, thug, and so, you know, if we have to be somewhere, uh, the a flight to safety counsels us to be in dollars or to be in treasuries, and that's why I would suspect that if we go into a deep global worldwide recession as a result of the shutdown or or worse yet a, a real depression, I think that'll probably be good for the dollar in. in in the short term, I, I I don't know where else people are going to put money because, um, you know, in in depressions, cash is the best thing to have, and treasuries are the nearest thing to cash. But cash is increasingly hard to have. You'd say, well, why would anyone accept negative interest rates when they could just hold the cash literally under their mattress or something for a few years until rates went positive again or something, and then they they wouldn't be having a loss at all? Well, because it's, it's hard to get cash. Uh, you know, go. Go to your local bank branch in the United States and say, I want $10,000. First, they'll say, well, why? <laughs> and you'll say, what do you mean, why? It's none of your business. Uh, but it is their business because we have what's called know your customer rules here. Uh, and we have uh, what are called SAR, suspicious activity reports, which not just banks, but also uh, uh, car dealers, jewelry dealers, pawn shops, other places are required to file on certain transactions. So that's a little spooky. But, you know, you just it's very, very difficult to get cash They're 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 more and more pulling hundred dollar bills out of circulation and just replacing them with 20s. And so, you know, the idea that you might have pull a million dollars out of the system to protect yourself from loss against negative interest rates, really hard, really difficult. And then you have the security question, where do you put it? You don't want to be in a safe deposit box in the bank because banks can have uh, bank holidays or shutdowns, which means you got to have some sort of private vaulting or storage at home or something, which is its own, its own issue. 
So, um, you know, for a lot of people, you know, who aren't as apocalyptic maybe as us, they look at a treasury and say, eh, you know, least dirty shirt in the laundry. Yeah, that's a that's a good way to put it. Uh, and so in terms of political activism and what, what can be done about it, I know you've also uh, expressed some skepticism about political activism. Why is that? Yeah, I'm, I'm bad at this. You know, I, I, we, we have a mission at the Mises Institute to try to promote the Austrian perspective because we think that it's absolutely critical to civilization. I don't want to sound grandiose or something, but to civilization to have real money. And I think that central banks have become the most dangerous uh, institutions on earth, save for maybe people who have access to nuclear weapons. So I think there's nothing more important for the future, our grandchildren, than for you know bringing you know to to people's minds, educating people about money. I think there's nothing more important in the, in the purely educational realm. That said, I don't begrudge anyone political activism. It's not my thing. Very, very tough environment in America because it's so polarized and people are so tribal, red team, blue team. And I mean, look at the polarization in the UK over Brexit. Really ugly. It breaks down over urban versus rural. It breaks down older versus younger. It breaks down over black folks and white folks. You know, it's just endless. And, and politics doesn't make that better. It doesn't create some happy compromise down the middle. It, it intensifies it almost by, by design. And so we don't have this pretense anymore that somebody who runs for office is going to represent everyone if they win. It's, it's more like I'm going to win and then the people on the other side deserve to be vanquished. You know, that's what democracy is yielding us in America with 320 million people. Very, very unsatisfactory result. So, I, you know, I don't necessarily have the answer to how you win over uh, 60 or 70 million people in America for to vote for some presidential candidate of your choice or something. That's a lot of people. And I think we're, we're a long ways away from that. So I, I like the idea of uh, acting locally, and I like the idea of acting entrepreneurially. We earlier mentioned the, you know, Bitcoin's role in this, Uber's role in this. Uh, there's a lot of other entrepreneurial ventures that do what they can or do what they must to circumvent the state, to work around it, because you don't, you know, it's kind of like Aikido, the martial art where you try to redirect energy. The state, the state is not something you want to take head on in, in most cases. And in the United States, especially, if you're an average person, if the U.S. federal government comes and screws with you, your remedy for that is to sue them in federal court, in their own court. Unless you have you know, a, a couple million dollars for legal fees in 10 years, that's an illusory remedy for the vast majority of people. So I think, I think the, the, the goal for me personally is to bring or try to bring Austrian economics to wider and higher audiences, and then to hope that uh, we help. Obviously, we're just a very minor uh, uh, organization in a, in a big world, but hope to, to plant some seeds or to spark some sparks uh, because in, in every human society, really, there's about maybe five or 10% of people who are drivers or vanguard. And that's just the way it is. And most people will sort of go along to get along. And, you know, unless and until things get really bad, they probably won't agitate for huge changes. That's just, that's just human nature. And there's nothing wrong with that per se. It's, it's probably good that we aren't uh, pulling out pitchforks every day, but we're getting pretty close to that pitchfork uh, stage as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yes, and uh, you also have spoken on this topic, and I, I like the way you reflected this, was uh, this idea of smaller is better, right? So it's this idea that, look, even maybe it's good, it's a good thing that people can just recognize that maybe we're not all going to agree and come under one banner, and maybe it would be better to have smaller towns and have a more of a secessionist approach to things. Uh so what are your thoughts on the hope of that kind of movement and that kind of idea? Well, I hate the resistance to it because it's clearly humane. It's, it's, the, it's the way forward without civil war, without having to politically vanquish people. And when you start to get into big countries with big populations, that doesn't, you know, United States, of course, but also China and India, former Soviet Union. I mean, it's very difficult to run the lives of that many people centrally, even you know a country like Germany, 80 million people, uh, 
you know, having a, a highly centralized government is just a recipe for cultural division, for strife, uh, for dissent, for hatred. And, and, you know, we see this all the time. And if you look at Switzerland, if you look at their website, if they're, if their subsidiarity principles, one of the things they say very plainly is that we like, we, we move every decision down to the most local level possible. Uh, and we do this on the grounds of social cohesion. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I, I think smaller is better because if you have a bad government, it's a little more isolated. It's not as weaponized across as many people. It claims dominion over fewer people. Uh, it is less likely to be able to um, to have an imperialistic presence. You know, Liechtenstein is not going to roll tanks into Poland anytime soon, right? I think we can all agree on that. And, and that's because Liechtenstein's small and worried about making money and being rich. So the, the problem with whether you want to call it federalism or subsidiarity or even outright secession, the, the notion of politically unyoking ourselves from each other in lieu of some sort of cold or, God forbid, hot civil war. The, the problem is that a lot of people are so convinced of the moral certainty of their program um, that it must be for everyone. And so there's a lot of people on the left who, if they were more open to secession today, or at least a, 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 huge, a much larger degree of subsidiary, could have virtually everything they want right now in blue states. If we just were, would agree that abortion and gun control and taxes and climate change and all these other things don't have to be decided centrally for all 50 American states in Washington. They could have a lot more of what they want right here today. But the problem is, is they would say, well, you know, and I would say to them, well, you know, you don't like these red states. Why do you want to be politically yoked to them? They would, I think they would answer with kind of a savior complex. They'd say, yes, but there's some, there's some, you know, good people in those states, some, some minority folks or some, uh, you know, blue state folks just like us. And we're not going to uh, throw them over. We're not going to let you dominate them. We need to, to protect everyone. You know, I think, I think you'd get sort of that mentality. And I, you know, there's just been, uh, there's been a, a you know this idea of manifest destiny in the United States, where we the United States started out in the colonies and moved moved westward into the the Midwest and Ohio, and then had the Louisiana Purchase, and then uh, had some wars with Mexico, and then ultimately ended up all the way out getting California and then Hawaii and Alaska a state. So 50 is this nice round number, and I think in a lot of people's minds we could never we could never undo that. That's just unthinkable, but um, it's getting more thinkable. <laughs> uh, you know, Gavin Newsom is starting, to re Governor Gavin Newsom of California is starting to refer to California as a nation state, pushing back against Trump. And so these are interesting times and people are starting to get very frustrated with the limitations of, of a faraway government. I think that's a healthy thing and I'm all for it. Right. Yeah. And so we are... Uh... We, we were even potentially seeing some different U.S. states thinking of banding together in their in terms of their response against coronavirus. So is that another vector by which we might start to see uh, this uh, smaller is better idea play out? Well, look at Australia. I mean, there are parts of Australia which have extremely low population density. And there's no reason anyone who lives in those parts of Australia should be doing anything but their normal day to day. Right. I mean, they should be out and about. And and the United States is much the same way in our Mountain West. Uh, you know, we have vastly unpopulated states like Wyoming and Montana and South Dakota. And then we have densely populated parts of Manhattan and all that. And so the idea that there needs to be one coronavirus rule for the whole country is obviously just goofy and it, it makes no sense. And it's it's. Um, it's been interesting that we've had this sort of laboratory of states. We've had not just within the U.S. 50 states, but all around the world. We've had some very interesting experiments in Taiwan. We've had some very interesting when I, I experiments. I'm speaking about coronavirus um, in South Korea. We have a very exper interesting experiment happening in Sweden. Uh, so we're going to see. We're going to have a scoreboard of sorts, as gruesome as that sounds. Uh, to see whether social distancing really works, what what the story is with herd immunity, um, but from my perspective, Stefan, the, the, even even slightly risking Great Depression Part Two uh, for 
50 or 100,000 deaths in the U.S. I think is absolutely crazy. I, I think that is sheer insanity. I think it's a wild overreaction. And we have to remember there's, there's, there's death when you're in the ground, and then there's sort of partial death where your lifespan is shortened or the, your quality of life is reduced be, for, you know, because of alcoholism or depression and mental illness or uh, because of a lower standard of living and a, and a worse diet or because you have a, a, you know, worse schools, uh, worse, worse uh, apartment or house. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to shrink life. That you know, you don't have to be dead in in the ground to suffer a diminution in your life, and that's what is so tough to argue with the lockdown folks right now. And I, I'm an anti lockdown person, hundred percent. I think we should lift it today. What is it, April twentieth or thereabouts? I would have never instituted the lockdown. And when someone says to me, "Well, how many lives would it take?" or "Do you don't value life?" or something like that, I I I would simply answer that the economics and life are not so neatly severable. They're, they're part of the same thing. And uh, we've had viruses before. Markets can help us take care of viruses. And we've had all kinds of, uh, of you know, we had the Spanish flu in the, around 1918 in the United States, which killed 600 some thousand people out of a much smaller population back then. And, and during that, everybody went to work. Everybody kept moving forward. Uh, look, People went to work in London during the Blitz. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know what to say. I, it's just a, a fundamentally different worldview between myself and people who think we should just shut down and hunker at home. And and again, I don't want to hate people who have that worldview. I don't want to impose myself on people who have that worldview. I want to separate myself politically from them. Yeah, and uh, you, I think... The other point that we as libertarians make is this idea that the world is way more interconnected than the central planners understand. They may include, they may think, okay, I'll decide this industry is essential and that is non-essential. But the lesson that we can draw from, say, essays such as I Pencil, that no one person knows how to make a pencil. Uh, uh, how do you uh, try to communicate that point to people who are sort of naively fixated only on coronavirus deaths to the exclusion of all those other things that we miss out on? Well, there, if we keep this up, they're going to find out because Americans have not experienced real hardship, economic hardship in a long, long time. And there's a lot of younger people alive today who are, are you know, they, they don't know what it's like to go to Walmart and not have 50 jillion kinds of toothpaste and deodorant and all this stuff is just going to be there. And pretty soon it's not. Because if you think just organize and forget a pencil, try organizing a Walmart centrally. Try to plan all those prices and all those items and and how much of each and when to reorder and when to restock. I mean, a, a Walmart is a vast, a single Walmart is a vast enterprise unto itself. And if we think that food production won't be affected, that we're going to be able to sit at home for three months or six months, and then all of a sudden reopen and have this V-shaped recovery. Um, I, I think that's just sheer economic ignorance. People don't understand the fragility, the interconnectedness of the world. And they also don't understand division of labor and specialization. You know, there's, it, it's, th there's a reason why things are inexpensive at Walmart. And, and that is because Walmart sells a lot of stuff at very low margin. That's how they make money. They make a couple pennies off each item that's going through that scanner. They don't make a dollar off of three dollar pair of, uh, you know, socks. So, a lot of that is specialization and in international trade. A, a three dollar pair of socks can be produced in China and shipped all the way to America, a long way on a boat for oftentimes less than they can be made in, in the United States. There's a lot of reasons for that. You know, libertarians have their opinions about those reasons, but that's just a fact right now. And if people want to think that they can just sort of, well, we don't need all this Chinese stuff. <laughs> okay, that's a nice, that's a tough guy thing to say on Facebook, but, you know, your income's not necessarily going to go up and that $5 t-shirt's going to be 10 bucks. So, and you multiply that over a year, 
let's say you're a frequent Walmart shopper. You know, th- this is this is not negligible. This would be a real impact on your material standard of living. And I, I'll I'll believe it when I see it. When Americans say, you know, I don't mind. I'll accept, uh, you know, a lesser material standard of living to be uh, free of Chinese influence or something like that. I'll, I'll believe that when I see it because that's that's easy to say. It's not so easy to do. And and let's be, and let's, re, let's let's also remember a lot of people around the world. Are make a living off of importing stuff to America. So if we're not buying stuff or as much from around the world, there are going to be a lot of people in less affluent countries who are hurting very badly. Uh, countries with lower per capita income, with worse public health systems. So you know it's it's the ripple in a pond from throwing a pebble. Except this wasn't a pebble; this was a giant rock. Yeah, and I think another point that anarcho-capitalist libertarians get accused of is that oh you guys are too utopian why are you thinking you want but where i think a very strong counter that i've seen you articulate is this idea of better not perfect so what's that all about yeah we're the utopians except when there's a crisis the first thing they do is start uh cutting fda regulations on drugs and saying that uh, medical doctors and nurses can practice across state lines we're not going to uphold the licensing requirements uh, we're going to strip away all the all the uh, FDA regulations on testing ventilators, and you know Dyson Fan Company can just create a bunch of ventilators real quick, and we'll let hospitals use them without the normal regulatory process. So it's interesting that we're the utopians, uh, but I, you know, there is a trap out there for libertarians, which is that we have to explain everything perfectly. Well, what what would this look like if we didn't have any government? And the, the short answer is sometimes we don't know. But what we do know is that people spend their own money more efficiently than they do other people's money, and that skin in the game and incentives matter a whole lot, and government doesn't have either of those things. And so what we think of as markets is is really just another word for human beings muddling through, doing their best, coming up with solutions as they always have decade after decade, century after century. And so I like the the odds on human beings you know, working cooperatively in the market over top down centralized bureaucratic control by people who, if they're wrong, unlike private business owners, are never punished for it. Uh, obviously, there's moral hazard with the Fed and investment banks and Wall Street. I, we don't, don't need to get into that, but you know my point. Uh, bureaucrats not only are not punished for failure, oftentimes they're rewarded a bigger budget. You know, FEMA needs more money. The FDA needs more money. Uh, so that, that there's something very perverse about, you know, uh, the, the accusation that libertarians are utopianists, because to me, it's the most pragmatic, bottom-up uh, approach to organizing society of all. It's just it's you, it's your family, it's your, uh, you know, your neighborhood, your local businesses. That's, that's all markets are. It's not some nefarious system. I don't even consider libertarianism an ideology per se. I, I consider it more, uh, you know, some, what happens when you leave people alone. <laughs> and uh, th- there's a lot of creative and technical genius in this country. And the idea that we can't handle a virus without this crazed, centralized response from Washington is very, very frightening to me. So yes, I think better not perfect ought to be our mantra. And we ought to push back against the the notion that we have to have a perfect solution to every human problem, because those human problems exist under the, the status system we have now. Yeah, that's a really excellent um, point. And I think for, for, the, for the last question, uh, let's talk about your outlook over the next, let's say, five years uh, from an economic point of view. And I know we touched on some of that. And also, I guess, uh, uh, in terms of Bitcoin, what, what's your uh, thought on how things progress over the next five years? Well, I'm frightened because I don't think there's going to be a V-shaped recovery to this economic debacle, which we are just getting into. We don't know how deep and severe it's going to be, but I don't think the recovery is going to look like 08, let's say 2008 to 2011 or in there, because the, one of the big differences here is that you've got a lot more fiscal stimulus. That's not central banks. That's just Western governments spending money, giving people money, uh, paying them unemployment, giving them food stamps, giving them just stimulus checks, 
whatever it might be. And that is all money that's going directly into the economy. That's not being parked as bank reserves somewhere. I mean, that is money that is being put in people's bank accounts and spent. So the idea that you can just create trillions of dollars out of thin air, not pay for it via taxes, and put that you know, liquid into the economy with no uh, you know, adverse price inflation, I think is, is very, 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 very unlikely. So that's a big difference between now and 08. The second big difference is that on the monetary policy side, not the fiscal policy side, but on the monetary side in 08, what, what basically happened was the Fed went into hyperdrive in pushing interest rates down, which caused a lot of problems, but, but, uh, but buying assets in the form of treasury debt and mortgage-backed securities from commercial banks. Now, there was a lot of moral hazard in that because they were buying these, these uh, especially the mortgage-backed stuff at face value when if you had marked to market, it would have been worth far less. So it was a, it was a moral hazard and a bailout and basically a, a free recapitalization of bank balance sheets. However, that money was basically parked at the Fed as reserves. So banks were able to, to build back up and, and there were still reserve requirements then. There aren't any more. So banks were able to build up big reserves and they were still very, very, very reticent to lend, even flush with reserves, even uh, with very low interest rates, because obviously they don't lend out reserves. Reserves are reserves. Uh, so banks were very much capital constrained, as we as we found out, despite all this seeming new liquidity. And they also didn't find as many credit worthy borrowers as Uncle Sam hoped they would, because the idea was to uh, get the banks back on their feet, recapitalize them, and then they'd go out there and lend. And that would prop up housing once again, prop up uh, the economy, uh, hiring jobs, et cetera. And, but basically, all it did was prop up the stock market. And most of those newly created uh, base money reserves stayed just that, stayed as reserves. So this time, they're buying assets, uh, another round of QE, but, uh, but they're also injecting a lot of money directly into the economy through lending facilities. And you know whatever we say today about what the Fed's doing in America is going to be obsolete in a week because it seems like every few days they announce a new lending facility. They're going to be lending against assets that are backed by student loans, assets that are backed by credit card debt assets that are you know uh, municipal bonds corporate bonds through ETFs so they are increasingly becoming a player more and more in the market and i'm absolutely convinced that within a few years the fed like other central banks would just simply be buying us stocks outright uh the, the bank of japan does that swiss national bank does that uh, you know, so I don't think that that's off the table. Yellen was talking about that a couple of years ago, but clearly that then the 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 incentive for that or the motivation for that is now intensified with this stock market crash. So you put all that in a blender, and to me anyway, it looks like a very different animal from 2008 because it, most of what happened in 08 was a stock market crash. Now that bled over into uh, obviously a recession in the general economy and to layoffs and people losing jobs. Don't get me wrong. But uh, most of the pain was in the stock market itself, and that was rectified through a crazy program of quantitative easing, and that worked in the sense that it, at least nominally it reinflated that market and blew it up. But this time around, uh, the pain is 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 small businesses. The pain is mom and pop. The pain is restaurants. The pain is retailers of all stripes because you know, when you're literally telling people to stay home, forcing them to, uh, and they've only got maybe a couple months worth of payroll or rent on, you know, that's hugely deflationary. So what, what individuals, businesses want to do, what markets want is deflation. They want to shed debt and buy less stuff. That's, de that's deflation because that's, that's the incentive right now for businesses and individuals. So the whole job of central banks is to thwart the market <laughs> and produce as much credit and liquid liquidity to have an offsetting inflationary pressure uh, to kill that deflation that the market really wants. And you and I know that that deflation is actually part of the cure. It's something that needs to happen. There needs to be a lot of liquidation of companies. There needs to be bankruptcy and insolvency, and there needs to be new ownership. And that's just the way it is, as, as, as sad as that is. And if there's going to be bailouts, if there's going to be stimulus, if there's going to be central bank monkeying around, 
for the love of God, we, it ought to be at the individual level. I, I mean, in terms of moral hazard, I'd rather that the Fed was just paying Joe Sixpack's mortgage uh, or, or, you know, giving money to Joe Sixpack rather than giving it through SBA or whatever. To, you know, most of the stimulus that, that the U.S. government has passed is going to go into the financial sector as usual. So it's it, once again, money's never neutral. Um, but if we're if we're going to have a bunch of helicopter money, I sure wish it was done at the most granular level, and and we're not seeing that. So the you know unlike 08, we're going to see an awful lot of little moms and pops and uh, go out of business probably in your town. It's it's heartbreaking, and I don't want to say this. Believe me, I got a couple of teenagers. I do not want to say this, but I my overall sense is that it's it's worse than 08 but not as bad as the Great Depression. Uh, you know, Bob Higgs points out, Robert Higgs, the great economist, he points out that, you know, the thing is America has a lot of capital that that no matter what government and central banks do, it doesn't just go away. There's factories, there's roads, there's distribution networks, there's tech, there's physical buildings and power plants and facilities, you know, and all that, you know, doesn't just, can't just vanish because government's doing goofy things. So that's that's kind of our, you know, the the beauty of living in a in a relatively uh, modern or advanced economy and that's what the west has going for it. But man, we're doing our best to to uh to destroy it and and capital's not forever. Capital can be destroyed just as surely as it can be accumulated and destroyed a lot easier and faster. So um uh, man, I hope we don't have a war or something to get really crazy. There's a lot of things that can be concerning for us, uh, but uh, we will have to see how it all plays out, hey? Uh, but uh, thank you very much for joining me, Jeff. I really enjoyed uh, uh, chatting with you, and uh, I'm a big fan of the Mises Institute, and uh, I'm also a listener of the Human Action Podcast. So my, for my listeners, make sure you go and follow Jeff, check out the Human Action podcast and go to Mises.org. Is there anything else, uh, Where is there anywhere else that you would like my listeners to find you, Jeff? No, just at Jeff Dice on Twitter. But I think your listeners are, you know, they're going to know what sound money means and how important it is. And your listeners are hopefully uh, getting into Bitcoin and they're going to be fine down the road. And and I would just leave you with this. We can't be children. Um, we can't stomp our feet and wish things were different. We have to have a long-term view. Nothing we go through will be as tough as our great-grandparents. And so we ought to suck it up and get busy, you know, and uh, take on life with a smile. I'm not going to get be despondent about this, but we we shouldn't hesitate to point out the sons of bitches for what they are and let's uh, let them wreck the world. Thank you for joining me, Jeff. All right. Thank you. It's great to talk to you. Thanks to my Patreon supporters. If you want to sign up and get the episodes early and ad-free or be a part of the SLP chat group, go to patreon.com slash Stefan Levera or you can pay with Bitcoin. Just message me. If you're interested to advertise on the show, give me an email, stefanlevera at pm.me. And if you want the show notes and the transcript for this episode, go to stefanlevera.com slash 169. See you in the Citadels. <laughs>